again, if you, yeah, you're good. Um, if you are uh, coming in just now, uh, my name is Franklin Cruz. I'm just gonna be facilitating us and getting us through the talking points between the really, really meaty conversations. Um, we have a couple of folks here. So I just wanna give an opportunity for all of our speakers to just come through and shine your face on real quick um, and just introduce the team. So Franklin, passing it off to um, Sarah Mitchell. Hi everyone, uh, good evening. I am Sarah Mitchell. I am the EBT supervisor with the Food and Energy Division at the Colorado Department of Human Services. Um, I've been at the state for about eight years. In the past five years, I've been with the EBT program. Um, I am the primary contact at the state for EBT equipment for farmers and markets. So I am grateful to be here today to support you. So uh, thanks for the invite. Thank you, Sarah. Lani. Awesome. Hey, y'all. My name is Lonnie Bird. Um, I'm with Nourish Colorado. I'm the food access manager here. Um, I manage the Double Up Food Bucks program for the state of Colorado. Um, I've been doing food system work for um, a long time. This is the first time that I've done it in the nonprofit space. So it's a little different than um, community um, supported um, food system work, but I am happy to be here and hey. Thank you so much. And then we have Fatima. Hey everybody, um, nice to see you all. Thanks for showing up for this. I'm Fatima Imad, head farmer, ED at Frontline Farming and also serve at the pleasure of our constituency of farmers as the president of Mile High Farmers. I am so excited for today. It took us a lot to navigate this way for ourselves. And we really wanted to bring this to our communities to make it easier and help build on the knowledge that we all have. Well, thank you. And then Casey. Hi, everyone. My name is Casey. I use she, her, and they and them pronouns. I work with Frontline Farming as the data activist and systems manager. Um, I also have a working knowledge of our SNAP programming, and so I'm here to share a little bit about how we approach using SNAP as a farm. Uh, and without any further ado, I'll just hand it back to Franklin. Cool. Thank you. all um, On some other housekeeping tools, I think Casey did remind us all good equity practices. If you are able to put your pronouns and display names just to make sure that we honor you as you are. Um, other housekeeping tools as well. I will be monitoring the chat during people's presentations and um, I will be the one who will instruct them to end all of that. So if you are a person who wants to just use the chat, great. Also, if you just want to raise your hand, I can also monitor that as well. Any of the stuff that's being shared in terms of slides, informations and flyers, um, we can send them to you afterwards. Uh, so just let us know if that is something that is of interest to you afterwards in the group emails. And with that, I think we are all good. Are there any other questions or something that folks um, need us to know real quick? That's great. All right, Sarah, you're our opener. All right, perfect. So um, Franklin, if you can just share my slides, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, what I'm going to start out with is just what is SNAP? So SNAP stands for um, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, formerly known as food assistance or food stamps. And it provides nutrition benefits to supplement the food budget of needy families so that they can purchase food and move towards self-sufficiency. So SNAP is administered by the United States Department of Agriculture, USDA, Food and Nutrition Services, FNS. So there are federal partners. FNS authorizes qualified retailers, including farmers and farmers markets to accept SNAP. And they are also responsible for mo monitoring SNAP certified retailers to ensure they are following program rules. 
Local County Department of Human Services, they certify households to receive the SNAP benefits and issue monthly SNAP benefits to participants um, that access the SNAP via an EBT card. The Colorado Department of Human Services, which is my employer, we oversee the local county offices and ensure they are following program rules. If you can advance to the next slide. So what can SNAP buy? So basically SNAP can be used to purchase any eligible food items to feed the household, such as fruits and vegetables, meat, poultry, and fish, dairy products, bread and cereals, other foods such as snacks and non-alcoholic beverages, and seeds and plants which produce food for the household to eat. Households cannot use SNAP benefits to buy vitamins, medicines, supplements, prepared food for immediate consumption, paper goods, hygiene um, items, et cetera. So next, we're gonna take a look at how to apply to accept the SNAP program. If you can advance to the next slide for me. So in order to accept SNAP or EBT payments, you must first be approved by FNS. Once you're approved, you will then be considered a SNAP authorized retailer. So step one, before you start your application, you're gonna to need to register for um, an, a USDA e-authentication account in order to obtain access to the online application. Step two, you're gonna complete the online application. So after starting an online application, you do have 30 days to complete and submit your application. If your application is not submitted within 30 days, it will be deleted and you'll have to start all over. Before starting your online application, make sure you have the names, addresses, and social security numbers for each farm or market owner and then the sales data. And we'll go over a little bit in a little bit more detail um, on, in an upcoming slide of additional documents you may need. So um, here's a good time to kind of talk about some definitions. So FNS considers um, a direct marketing farmer or what I'm gonna reference as a farmer as an individual producer that sells their own agricultural products directly to the general public. They are able to move locations and a farmer or producer will complete the store application. Farmers markets are defined as two or more producers that sell their own agricultural products directly to the general public at a fixed location. A farmer's market will complete the farmer's market application. So step three, um, your application is not complete until you submit the required supporting documents. Instructions for submitting your documents are provided at the end of the online application. And then step four, after you submit your supporting documents to FNS, you can check the status of your application in real time. FNS has 45 days to process an application and will contact you if they need any additional information. If you have additional questions, you can contact the SNAP Retailer Service Center at 1-877-823-4369. Once approved, you're, you will receive a SNAP permit and a seven-digit FNS number. FNS uses this number to identify your farm and then you as the owner or responsible official. Keep this number safe and private. You will need this information in order to obtain EBT equipment. Direct market farmers and farmers markets are considered an exempt retailer. As an exempt retailer, you are eligible to receive no cost EBT equipment. FNS will automatically notify Colorado's EBT vendor, which is FIS, through a ready file. This ready file is also available to other third-party processors 
So you could be contacted um, by a third party processor wanting to sell their sell you equipment um, to newly certified retailers. FIS, which is Colorado's EBT vendor, will usually reach out to me when they have received notification of a newly approved farmer to determine if Colorado will be able to support them with no cost EBT equipment. So if we can advance to the next slide, this is going to just provide you with some information on documents that you'll want to gather before starting that online application. So you're going to need the date the farm was opened under the current ownership or intended opening date if it is new. Farm official name, mailing address, and address where the farm is located. Actual retail sales data from your farm. Uh, farm's most recent IRS tax return if it has been under current ownership longer than one year. Farm's operating schedule. EIN number for your business, if applicable, you must provide it. And then identify a responsible official and have their name, home address, social security number, and date of birth. So moving on to the next slide, um, providing a little bit more information. So only the responsible official can complete official business related to accepting SNAP at your farm. So in addition to the documents we just covered, you will need to identify a responsible official. This may be the owner, board member, market manager, or person operating in a similar position of authority. If more than one, um, you'll need the documents for every person listed. Those applying as a government agency, nonprofit organization, or publicly owned corporation are exempt from providing their social security numbers. And then you will need electronic copy of photo ID, social security um, card. If applying as a nonprofit, copy of the 501c3 determination letter from the IRS. If you have a business license to do business at that location, you must submit a copy. If your local authorities don't require then this does not apply to you. And then finally, certific certification and signature statement. Um, you must print and sign and return the statement and the statement must be signed by the responsible official. So that's applying for becoming a SNAP certified retailer through FNS. So on our next slide, EBT. So EBT is an electronic system that allows a SNAP participant to pay for food using SNAP benefits, similar to a debit or credit card. When a participant shops at a SNAP authorized retailer, their SNAP EBT account is debited to reimburse the store for the food that was purchased. And then the store's bank account is credited, usually within two banking days. In addition to SNAP benefits, the Colorado EBT program also processes cash payments, um, as an example, TANF or Colorado Works, uh, to the Colorado EBT card. So EBT, Colorado EBT cardholders may have an available balance for food, cash, or both. As mentioned earlier, um, direct market farmers and farmers markets are classified as exempt retailers through FNS. As an exempt retailer, the state of Colorado is required to provide no cost EBT equipment. Currently, Colorado has limited state funding to support farmers and markets with wireless equipment. And then we have unlimited funding to provide wired point of sale devices. Next year in 2023, we should have the ability to expand wireless option to all farmers and markets which I'm super excited about because um, I do understand that a wired device um, is not ideal for farmers and markets. FNS currently has a grant opportunity to provide SNAP mobile app option through MarketLink. 
So with this FNS um, grant through Market Link, it will provide one year of free mobile equipment to accept SNAP or EBT. The store, market, or farmer can secure equipment to process electronic payment through a third-party processor um, to accept debit, credit, and or EBT. Um, this option, the market would be responsible for the cost. So basically, there's three options to secure EBT equipment. Option one is through the state of Colorado. The second option is through Market Link, which is the grant opportunity through FNS for one year of free mobile equipment to accept SNAP. And then lastly, you can locate and obtain your own equipment through a third party processor. With the last option, you're responsible for all costs. So Moving on to the next slide. Um, first, we'll take a look at the FNS option. So uh, Market Link is a program of the National Association of Farmers Market Nutrition Program. In partnership with FNS and the Novadia Group, Market Link assists farmers and markets with SNAP retailer application and connects them with free app-based SNAP EBT processing equipment. Novadia also has the option to integrate credit and debit payment processing. Um, additional fees do apply for the debit and credit option. So who is eligible? Market Link is designed for direct market farmers and farmers market. Um, who's not eligible? Businesses that are not a farmer or market. Farmers or markets with functioning SNAP EBT equipment obtained through this grant or um, receiving equipment through a state-sponsored free equipment program. So um, quickly going over the steps to apply for Market Link, um, the first step would be to complete um, the Market Link eligibility application. The cool thing with Market Link is they can assist the retailer or, or assist the farmer with your application to become a FNS SNAP retailer application. So if you haven't started that up, that process yet to become SNAP certified, you may want to consider the Market Link application so that Market Link can assist you with that application process. Uh, step two, you're going to complete the FNS SNAP retailer application to receive your SNAP um, authorization number and permit if you have not done so already. And then set up processing, transaction processing in order to accept the electronic payments. You do need to set up an account to process those payments through the approved payment gateways. The companies that provide these gateways between accounts are called the third party processors or TPPs. You do need to set up an account with a merchant um, to set up a merchant account with a third party processor to be able to accept the SNAP EBT um, and or debit and credit transactions. For market link, for this market link grant, the SNAP EBT transactions are processed through the Novadia group and you'll get an email with instructions and market link has an option, like I said, to integrate their debit and credit. Um, there are some additional fees that apply to the debit credit option. And then um, the fourth step is you'll receive the equipment um, what's included is one year free use of the total pay go app, no per transaction fee, you'll get a free card reader, a printer waiver, an option to integrate that debit and credit. As a note, this is a bring your own device option or program so market link customers you'll need to bring your own smart device with services to run the total pay go app. With this market link grant, you are granted a printer waiver, which basically um, allows the uh, retailer to not have to provide a printed receipt at the end of the transaction. Um, we can send out a market link handbook for more information. So next, on the next slide, we'll talk about um, the Colorado supported no cost EBT equipment. So you'll need to speak to me uh, to determine what options Colorado has available and what option would work best for you. Currently, we only have one option available, which is the wired point of sale device. 
Um, we have ran out of funding for wireless equipment. Um, I think that I might have one slot available um, and those slots are filled on a first come first serve basis. But um, as of right now, that slot hasn't opened up, but I think it will. Anyhow, um, the first option, like I said, is a wired device or wired option. So Colorado will lease the one wired EBT only point of sale device. Colorado will cover the cost of the lease and the ongoing monthly transaction fees. This option requires a dial up or ethernet connection. The wired device can be located at the farmer market or offsite at another location. If the wired device is located off site, the farmer would complete a paper voucher and then clear or redeem the voucher on the wired device within the next couple of days. And there's a handout available for more information on the manual voucher process. The second option that Colorado has available is a wireless option. Colorado with this option will lease one wireless EBT only device. Colorado will cover the cost of the lease and ongoing monthly transaction fees. This option only works with AT&T cellular service. You don't need to have an AT&T plan. There just needs to be an AT&T tower in the area. And then um, the device will only process EBT transactions. No debit or credit. As mentioned earlier, Colorado does have limited funding currently, um, and I'll provide you with the options that are available once you contact me. Um, it does look like Wired may be the only option. Um, FIS is Colorado's EBT vendor that processes EBT transactions for us. They are also um, the right, vendor that will Perfect. It looks like we may have lost the slides, and I think Franklin might be working on that. Um, so if you choose an option through Colorado, FIS, um, once I notify FIS that Colorado is supporting your farm, FIS, someone from FIS will email you with some um, additional instructions. You'll be required to sign a contract and provide banking information so that they can set up your account to start transaction processing. EBT systems have an end of day processing time with all transaction, when all transactions for the day are totaled and then the transfer begins. So payments are usually deposited into your bank account within the two banking days after the system end of day. My contact information will be provided at the end of the presentation. Awesome. So if we can go back one slide for me, Franklin, perfect, thank you. So, Let's just talk real quick about how to accept a payment. So once you're SNAP certified, you get, um, so I guess this would be more so for a wired or wireless point of sale device, but would work similarly if you had the mobile app option. Um, but once you're approved to accept SNAP, you can start taking payments at your market. Um, Here's the how to make a payment, like I said, on the point of sale device. It would be similar in the mobile app option, but it might look a little bit different. You and your employers should follow the general steps for a successful SNAP purchase. So um, step one, if you don't have an electronic cash register or scanning system, you'll need to separate the SNAP eligible items from ineligible items. You will total the eligible food purchases on the register or manually if you're not using a register. You'll have the customer swipe their EBT, swipe their EBT card through the point of sale device, enter the total food eligible, SNAP eligible um, purchases into the point of sale device if it's not connected to a cash register. The SNAP EBT customer will enter their PIN and press the enter key. 
Only the card holder is allowed to do this. When a PIN is used for a SNAP EBT purchase, you don't need the customer's signature and no other identification is needed. If there are sufficient funds and the PIN is entered correctly, an approved message will appear and a receipt is printed. If there is not sufficient funds, the transaction will be denied. And then in this situation, the SNAP customer may use another form of payment. You'll give the customer um, a receipt, give a receipt to the SNAP EBT customer that shows the purchase amount and then the balance in the customer SNAP account. Manually key transactions. So when the EBT card is swiped through the point of sale device, the device reads account information from the magnetic strip on the back of the EBT card. If the magnetic strip is damaged, it uh, won't read through the point of sale device. If this happens, you may use the um, key, keypad to enter the card number, um, but don't manually enter numbers from an EBT card unless the SNAP customer and the EBT card is present. Paper EBT vouchers. So as mentioned previously, if the firmer doesn't have a point of sale device on site, or the point of sale device stops working, you can use a paper voucher to complete a SNAP transaction. You can get paper vouchers from the provider of your point of sale device. Whenever you complete a paper voucher, ask the customer to sign. The signature takes place of that PIN entry. You should call the processor to, um, for approval while the customer is present. If you call the processor after the customer leaves and there aren't enough funds in the customer's account, you won't get paid. Then you must electronically clear a voucher using your point of sale device or send the voucher to the processor um, within a certain amount of time. So um, the last slide I have today is just some tips and best practices. So, you can visit the Farmer Producer FNS website for more information. Know your FNS number and keep your SNAP permit in a safe place. Know who your FNS responsible official is and notify FNS of any changes to that responsible official. Know how the farmer or market obtained EBT equipment and when. Keep all FNS and EBT records in a safe place, permits, contracts, training materials, documents, et cetera. This one's more for market managers, so uh, or for farmers markets, but plan for market manager transitions. Ensure FNS and EBT vendor is notified if they are a responsible official, and then ensure all appropriate paperwork is turned over with the position. Be prepared for the new market season. As a SNAP retailer, you are legally responsible for your actions and the actions of everyone who works in your store, farm, or market, whether they are paid or not. Breaking program rules could result in losing your SNAP permit, being fined, or criminal um, action. All right, and then on the last slide has my contact information. So you can definitely reach out to me if you have any questions, if you're in need of some EBT equipment. My email is um, up on the slide. It's sarah.a.mitchell at state.co.us. And then my phone number 720-202-8958. So it does look like um, Jess had asked if um, you can get the slides and yes, the slides. And I have some additional handouts um, that can be shared after the presentation today. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, we're gonna share the slides, Jess, and um, some of the resources that you mentioned, Sarah, if you can follow up with that, we're gonna make a package for everyone as well as some of our farmers are out in the field right now, y'all. It's busy planting time. And so recording this will be valuable for them as well. Thanks, Sarah. I'll yeah, pass it no back. problem. Awesome. Franklin, you here?
I know Franklin's having some. Yeah. I, I, so we do have a couple questions that came in. Um, bear with me while I figure out. Um, got some questions here. I don't know, Sarah, if you're able to answer some of these, but uh, there's a question. What if my business grows food at multiple locations? Will all addresses be required? So from my understanding, and this is um, really through FNS, our federal partners, but from my understanding, um, what will be provided is the mailing address and the address where the farm is located. Um, if you have just one farm stand and that's on the farm, great. Um, but if you have the multiple locations, um, I'm not sure if you need to provide those to FNS. Um, if they ask for that during the application process, you would want to provide that. Um, but if not, I would just provide your main address of either where the farm is located or where the farm, the main farm stand will be located. And then if you have any additional questions, I would definitely reach out to FNS directly. And that was on one of the slides as well for the SNAP Retailer Service Center. All right, so it looks like we have was there more funding previously for machines and what happened to that? Just out of curiosity for advocacy, not most important questions. So um, the state of Colorado did have some additional funding um, through a FNS grant to provide wireless equipment. That funding ended September of 2021. Um, and so, yes, we had more slots available and more funding that went away. Um, but like I said, not that it helps for this season, but we are very hopeful that at the beginning of 2023, that we have something um, and some additional funding to expand and provide wireless to all farmers and farmers markets. Does the total pay device integrate with Square if we already have the ability to accept debit credit cards through Square? And how does that affect the transaction fee for SNAP customers or vendors? So the total pay app is through Novadia and the market link um, grant funding um, provides the one year. And then after that, you can purchase or pay um, to continue that total pay. This is not my area of expertise. So if there is anyone that has more experience, definitely feel free. But from what I understand is to the square can't accept the EBT, but there is a way to integrate both the total pay and square. Um, but there are two different devices. One device would accept debit and credit and then a separate to accept EBT. But anyone have any additional thoughts that are currently using it or have used total pay in the past? Um, Sarah, I'm, I can help with that. This is Lonnie. Hey y'all, so um, a couple of my um, retailers use um, Total Pay, and um, I'm not sure um, if the question um, is if Square, to so Square and um, Total Pay don't completely integrate. So for instance, if you have um, like um, inventory in your Square um, register, if you were to get total pay, then it will not, if you get total pay register, let me rephrase that. If you get total pay register, the inventory that you have in your square will not fully integrate with, um, it won't integrate at all with um, total pay register. So total pay has a couple of different products that they use. So total pay register, um, is the full gamut. So you really wouldn't even need Square anymore if you have the total pay register um, system. 
And then um, Total Pay Go is just an app that you use with um, your card reader, a card reader that they provide for you. And um, you can still use it with, with your Square, but it they don't integrate where Square will not um, keep track of whatever you run through Total Pay. So you still will have two different reporting or two different reports. So you'll have one just from Total Pay and one from Square. Thanks, Lonnie. Oh, no, you're you. good. That's um, super helpful. I'm going to say, uh, there. I think there's one more question, question five, and then I'm going to actually pass it to you, Lonnie. Um, and then we'll come back to the questions after your section, just to make sure we have time. So this awesome. question, yeah, go for it, Sarah. So how long does the FNS SNAP permit last? Don't quote me on it. I believe there is a time period. Four or seven years is like coming to mind to me, but I'm not 100% sure. But you should be um, contacted by FNS when it's time for your recertification. So, you know, as it's coming to that expiration, and once you're approved, um, you should be notified of how, like how long that is good for. Um, and so you could make note of that. And then FNS should also be reaching out to you when it's getting close to that certification expiration to let you know what are those steps to recertify. And so um, I think you do need to complete a little bit of paperwork and provide some additional supporting documents. It's just to ensure that you continue to meet the eligibility criteria um, to accept the SNAP program. Wonderful. Yeah, five years. Okay, okay great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to pause there. And um, next on the agenda is we have Lonnie. Lonnie, you should have the ability to share your screen. So I will allow you to do that. And I'm going to drop the slide for the notes in one more time. Um, Sarah, thank you so much for the information. It was really valuable, even as myself, as someone who has processed SNAP through the farm, it, this is a lot of really good information. So our deepest appreciation for sharing your knowledge on this. So Lonnie, please take it away. Okay, here I go, y'all. Sorry, I'm the, the uh, technology. Um, am I sharing my screen? I am. Yay, you are sharing okay. your screen and we can see Yay. your um, PowerPoint. All right. All right, y'all. So I'm, once again, I'm Lonnie Bird. I'm here to talk about um, the Double Up Food Bucks program. Oh, let me turn this off. And um, yeah, so um, the Double Up Food Bucks program um, is an innovative food incentive program designed to help low-income families access fresh fruits and veggies for free while supporting local farmers and economies. Um, Double Up Food Bucks doubles the value of federal nutrition benefits, SNAP or food stamps, spent at participating markets and food retail stores. For every SNAP dollar spent, the shopper gets $1 to put towards buying local produce, up to $20 a day. Um, the, the program goals are to direct federal SNAP dollars into regional food systems, to document the need and demand for increased SNAP benefits, ensure families have access to fresh fruits and vegetables so they don't have to choose between healthy and hungry, support the vitality of small and medium-sized farms by expanding their consumer base, and support the viability of local farmers, markets, and grocers. So this is possible by, um, this is funded by the, um, what used to be called the Food Insecurity Nutrition Incentive Program, which is now called GUSNIP, the 2018 Farm Bill, which is $100 million um, over five years. It's a competitive grant program in all types of retail. So from farm stands to farmer's markets, to corner stores, to grocers, all of them have a chance to participate in this um, program. And it does require a dollar to dollar match. 
So currently, um, the Double Up program, it's a national program. So it's in 33 counties in the state, but it's in over 25 states. So how Double Up works. So um, like I was like we were saying, I was saying earlier, um, Double Up Food Bucks is a dollar for dollar match. So someone would go to your um, farm stand or market booth and they would buy SNAP eligible cards, not, excuse me, SNAP eligible foods with their EBT card. And then, then they get free double up food bucks to buy Colorado grown fruits and veggies up to $20 per day. So basically um, if you, I know this is mostly farmers and not market. So we'll just stick with farms. We're not gonna talk about farmers markets. I forgot about that. <laughs> Sorry y'all. And so what things, um, this is just like a little graphic about what um, you can buy with Double Up Food Bucks. So Double Up Food Bucks really promotes local foods. So um, as you'll see here, even though there's lemons and limes and an orange in there, don't mind that. But <laughs> as you can see on the left, mostly everything on the left is stuff that can be Colorado grown produce. And then on the right, you'll see um, bananas. So the, everything on the left is good. The bananas, no good. Um, here's a product eligible, eligibility guide. Oh, words. There, I'm having such a hard time with them tonight. <laughs> um, here's the product eligibility guide. So you can see um, Colorado grown fruits and veggies. Um, are eligible for Double Up Food Bucks. Colorado grown dried beans, fresh herbs, and food producing plant seeds and starts. So those are all things that you can buy with Double Up Food Bucks. Um, if you see on the left, you can see um, things that you can buy with SNAP and all things that you can buy with SNAP are not all things that you can buy with um, Double Up Food Bucks. And then here's a, another graphic so that you can see. Um, mushrooms are in there too, just in case you, um, some, I've had a couple of people ask me about mushrooms. So you definitely, you can um, sell mushrooms too, as long as they're Colorado grown. If you are a farm that is located in a county bordered by another state, produce from that state is um, also eligible. So a lot of our um, farmers that are, down in South Colorado will um, take stuff from, will um, have New Mexico produce and that is perfectly fine as long as you're in a bordering county of another state. But as you can see on the right hand side, the things that are ineligible. So um, <clears throat> you can't, even though you may, uh, you may produce things from fresh fruit, you may produce things that come from the eligible items. Once they're processed, you cannot, um, you can't use them at all. Um, they cannot be, they are not no longer double up food bucks eligible. Um, one caveat to that is if you are a farm that sells um, roasted chilies, you would just have to sell the chilies first and then you can roast them complimentary. And then that way they would be considered double up um, eligible. Um, Double Up Food Bucks helps us all. Of course, it helps um, bring home more healthy food. Um, farmers make more money. And then there's more um, food dollars that stay in the local economy. And so um, earlier I talked about how Double Up Food Bucks is up to $20 a day. Um, that is with the exception of if you have a CSA. So how Double Up works at a CSA is there is no daily cap. So you can, whatever your CSA box is, we can match your CSA box. So a customer can purchase a box and get one free. So example, um, so a customer pays for a full box, um, a full CSA box on May 1st. 
And then on May 8th, they would come back and their box would be free because that would be covered by their double up food box. So of course, when I say paid, uh, they're paying with their SNAP card. Um, and then a customer can um, pay with their SNAP card for half of a box and double up will match um, the other half. So the example of that is um, a CS bo CSA box is $42 and then the customer will pay $21 with their SNAP and then double up will cover the rest. So um, that's another way to do it. And then um, this also works if you have a mixed um, produce and like produce and eggs or produce and meat. Um, box, you can um, you can price your box so that half of it, so it, let's say you have a $42 box, you would say all of your non double up food bucks items are $21. And then the other half of the box, the other $21 are all of your double up food bucks eligible items. So the customer swipes their snap card and their SNAP is gonna cover the meat, the eggs, whatever in there that's not double up food bucks eligible. And then we will match the other half with um, to cover the produce that's in that box. And then, um, so one thing I, I'm sorry, I'm looking at my notes. Um, if you wanna know about where, where this is a statewide um, program. I left out, I'm sorry, I left out one of um, the slides. I just realized that um, there is a, I'll put it in the chat, how you can look up where um, Double Up is um, in your area. You can look it up by um, zip code. Um, Frontline is one of our partners, um, but yeah. And here's my information. I know that was super quick. <laughs> Please, if anyone has questions, ask me all the questions. So, uh, Lonnie, if you yes. want to stop sharing your screen, I'll share our questions. Oh, sorry. Screen. Yes. Let me You're all sharing. good. Okay. Uh, okay. Did I stop? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Franklin, do you want to read out these questions? I can see it. Can indeed. Why are eggs ineligible for Double Up? So Double Up is just, it's to promote um, produce, Colorado grown produce. Um, that's it. <laughs> it's, 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 it's just for produce. So um, eggs are not included in that. Hey, Lonnie, if it's okay, if I could add a note to it. Yep. I think a lot of it has to do that we should be aware about when these federal mandates are happening um, that allows this program, that there's often a lot of debate about what people that have been economically oppressed should have the selection of. And so it's hard to explain away why that is okay or not okay. It doesn't make a lot of sense, but ultimately in those debates, they conclude it's it's like easier to just give it to produce and not go into that. Like, why is it meat or other items? Or why do we regulate what people are going to eat through these programs? And so I don't think it often makes sense. Um, I'm willing to say that, you know, myself. Um, and so I think there's some deeper reasoning that's harmful there. Thank you, Fatima. Um, the next question is, what qualifies as a CSA? So is that for me? Is that a yeah. question for me? Um, like uh, Lonnie, to expand on this, thinking about the difference between farmers markets and maybe a direct to consumer farm that does a weekly produce box, um, how does that apply to food, food uh, double up food bucks and what would qualify as that versus so a farmer's if, market? So if you have a pre, like a, a box, like Casey said, if you if you have a box that you pre that you everyone gets the same um, box, that would be your CSA. Um, as far as farmers market goes, someone could come and individually pick out what they want. So that's that would be the difference between 
a CSA and farmers market? Or, or are you asking what is the difference between the spending at each? I'm not sure, sorry. Yeah, I that think was, that was my question. And I was mostly wondering if like a traditional CSA folks pay for like the entire season up front, um, which is obviously inaccessible. Um, and where I am working now, we have like a, we call it a subscri subscription um, and we have different box selections. So it is everyone gets the same thing. Um, and none of our boxes cost more than $20. Um, and for Snap customers, they're, they're uh, priced cheaper. So not sure if that's applicable, but I was just wondering if, if it was like a situation where they have to receive the box every week or if they have to pay up front or if it's okay if it's like a pay as you go situation. So it, it's, so, um, and Sarah, please um, correct me if I'm wrong. My understanding is that with Snap, you cannot pay for anything more than two weeks in advance. Yeah, Lonnie, we'll cover that in our section for fine okay. and some stuff. Okay. So I can I can take on that question a little bit more. But exactly okay. 14 days, they have to receive the food within 14 days after the payment. And I but. do have as one of my resources, um, it's from the USDA, USDA operating a CSA and SNAP participation. Um, so it does give a little bit more information. Um, this is something through FNS. Um, and it is 14 days in advance. And part of it is because SNAP is a needs-based program and SNAP um, clients have limited means and resources and SNAP benefits are loaded each month. Um, so it is that you can't accept payment more than the 14 days, but I do have a handout that can be provided afterwards that provides some additional information from the USDA. Good. Thank you, Katia, and thank you all. Fatima, you were going to say something? No, just thought that was a great segue into the next part, um, but I'll let you lead that. Yeah, again, um, if folks have more questions, we do have some time built in at the end for that. Um, and so next in our agenda, we're going to hear from Casey and Fatima about some uh, tricks to navigating SNAP as a farmer. So I'm going to leave it up to you two. Okay, wonderful. Well, I am pretty sure a lot of people on the call are familiar with frontline farming, but I wanted to just share a little bit about who we are. Um, Fatima, I don't know if you want to take this slide and just introduce us as the executive director of the nonprofit. Sure, Casey. Um, thanks. Um, so Frontline Farming is a Black, Indigenous, people of color, and women-led organization working towards food sovereignty and farmer liberation. We operate three different farm sites in total about five acres. We're certainly dedicated to um, producing food for our communities as well as training new farmers to take on growing food and letting them know that as Black, Indigenous, and people of color that um, there's space here and uh, bridges for us to grow in. So I could go to the next slide. Yeah, Casey. All right. So um, Katya, that was a great question. And even for us coming into doing SNAP work, uh, there's a lot to say about that. And Franklin's going to touch on at the end a little bit about enrolling people in SNAP itself that we do. Um, but I just wanted to talk to us a little bit about our own experiences and my own uh, coming from having experience certainly um, in, in accessing SNAP um, in my own lifetime and as a child and growing up, but also what we see a lot with farming communities. So one of the things, you know, is that we need to recognize a lot of times when we talk about it in farming communities, we talk a lot about it as charity, and we sort of expect that somehow SNAP customers should be coming to us, or why don't they know, or sometimes I know my first year when I got on Double Up Dollars, and before um, Amy Nelms, who was leading it, uh, I was like, oh my God, you know, I didn't get anybody that came to my market stand and am I, am I making enrollment numbers? And she was like, do you know that a whole bunch of farmers are having the same issue, calm down. Cause I felt like I needed to make some numbers to maintain that. 
And one of the important things about it is that, of course, providing healthy and nutritious food to all communities is a great endeavor and something we should all um, commit to. It's hard as farmers, we know that we're often asked to show up in places that are economically oppressed and sell our food at lower costs. But as farmers, we're pretty much already at our price margins. And so programs like SNAP and Double Up Dollars specifically allow us to meet both things. It's a really great program in that way. So that said, I think that it's important because I've been in a lot of conversations where people are more focused on why aren't these people coming to understand that as farmers and a farmer advocate, that these are customers, right? And just because someone has a SNAP card or however you qualify it, that is something that they should have and should count as money. And just as the question came before about what people can buy or not buy on SNAP and make their own choices for food consumption is a complicated question, right? For us at Frontline, we don't try to regulate people's choices and don't believe in doing that around food. We have our own free grocery. We don't prepack things like that. Of course, with things in the pandemic, it has changed, but we certainly believe in giving people the choice over food. Um, and so it's important for us to recognize that this is money. And it's interesting how even in the pandemic, it became a big issue because SNAP people and clients can't use their SNAP benefits to even get food delivered. And some of that got rectified during the pandemic because the reality became clear about how people would need those deliveries. And so some big legislative changes happened. So what I wanted to speak to everybody about is that this isn't just some client base that's there. Um, certainly all across the board, regardless of economic status, people need education on being greater consumers, but this is a market that's there and has a lot of support to help you in sort of things like double up dollars and that you should consider this community, a community that has money and you should put in the same efforts into marketing and reaching that community that you do to any other customer that you're trying to make money from. Um, some benefits of that is that as a farmer, you can also access greater, um, like, you know, in markets that are saturated, unless you have a niche product, it's not easy necessarily for you to get into that market. And being someone that might have SNAP as an individual person can help you also leverage getting to markets that are saturated and already have a lot of business. Another thing about it, and I think is important, whether you're a nonprofit or for profit, is that accessing and doing work around SNAP or in turn double up dollars can help you to leverage greater access to state and federal dollars or programs. So certainly there's granting programs, but there's a lot of other programs from the USDA and whatnot that support this work and can help support you in doing that. So as a farmer, um, I just wanted to sort of share that mainly we should respect these communities and recognize them as customers. And I'm gonna pass it to Casey, who's gonna talk to us a little about some of what's come up and how we've tried to navigate it. Awesome. So um, we are gonna share just some things that Frontline Farming has learned over the last couple of years of, of taking SNAP. Um, I, so I'm a data activist. I'm kind of academic or theoretical in some of the ways I think. A lot of uh, feminist theorists and theorists of color talk about sharing knowledge as you acquire it rather than waiting for it to be perfect in order to publish it. And so Frontline is kind of approaching this in that way where we're by no means an expert in using SNAP for farm sales. However, we have had some learnings and we're here to kind of share those learnings and do our best to answer questions and learn together as a community. So all ships rise with the tide kind of deal. So um, we did apply recently to MarketLink and it was a uh, extremely easy application. It took us about three minutes to complete it. They sent us a really helpful follow-up email saying here are your four bullet points of what you need to complete your application and get it finalized. It took within 
I think it was like less than two weeks for it to turn around. So it was a very quick application and, and um, low effort on our end. We are gonna use, last year we were using this, um, the Verifone through FIS, which was the, as Sarah mentioned, the Colorado State kind of EB, EBT no cost equipment that we were funded through, through the 2020 funding, and then that we lost that 2020 funding. So what we decided to do was for the last month of our processing, our CSAs in October of last year is we paid for our Verifone wireless equipment, which is a $45 monthly fee. Um, you know, we had, as a nonprofit, we do have some funding to cover it. We had maybe 10 or 12 SNAP uh, CSA members who we were processing the funding for. So it was a little bit of a hit, but it, you know, in the end, it kind of, it was a net positive. It also has this kind of 11 cent tra transaction fee. This year, we're gonna be moving to the total pay go through the market link, um, which our, our business manager, Jessica Cowett, whose birthday is today, and she's not on the call, but I wish her a happy birthday. Um, has been kind of managing our process with that. And it has been super easy to, to move through and go through that. One thing really nice about Total Pay Go is that there are no transaction fees and it is a monthly basis. To answer one of the questions that was in the chat, I haven't heard of any devices where you own the POS. All of the devices I'm aware of, you are, um, you're renting the POS. And so I don't know if there's any way to purchase it itself. What we do is we'll do a, a monthly rental and then through Total Pay Go, it'll get paid for a full year. What's really interesting here is that it is a one-year grant. And so as we're thinking through this, we are applying for this grant in, in May. We'll have it through our CSA season next season. And um, hopefully, fingers crossed, everything with Sarah and the state goes well, um, we would want to align that grant season with any um, no cost EBT equipment that would be available from the state. So we wouldn't want to start, for example, we wouldn't want to start our market link grant in the middle of the summer when half of next year would be covered by the grant, and half of next year would be covered by C, um, the Colorado Department of Human Services. So just something to think about as you're applying for grants is like when might free funding come about? and um, understanding that it is a monthly, a yearly grant. So, so when you apply determines when the fund ends. Um, we talked a little about Clover. There are, Sarah talked a little about manual vouchers. I'm gonna leave that to the end for further questions. Um, the other thing I wanted to share, is, so I, as like a data, a data person, I, I kind of manage our CSA as, um, sales come in to kind of manage the number of people, the number of sales, um, the personal data from the people who sign up and um, have some experience with our SNAP programming. So I wanted to share just some things that I learned about our CSA. One is that you can't pre-charge SNAP for a CSA. And so any, you, you can't use a credit either. So this is means that if you charge someone a SNAP on their SNAP card, they need, need to get the food within 14 days of that charge. You also cannot uh, technically charge a CSA and then have them, or give them the CSA and have them pick up a week later, that's technically credit. And that's not how the EBT finance system works. It, it cannot be used as credit. So you have to charge it before they receive the food. Um, another thing that we really uh, ascribe to is kind of what Fatima was talking about was minimizing the difference, uh, the minimizing the differentiation between your SNAP and your other customers as much as possible. So on the Frontline Farming website, we advertise that we accept SNAP. Uh, when you go and you click sign up for your CSA, there's a sign up form before the payment form. And the reason that is, is because I can issue um, essentially a, a coupon code that's like, oh, you want to sign up for a CSA, you're going to use your, your, you're hoping to use your SNAP benefits. That's amazing. Let's get you a coupon code that discounts your, your CSA price down to a low number so that this goes into the next point. 
um, the deposit, you have a deposit on it. So, you know, $5, $2, whatever it is, but you're basically saying you're going to sign up through the same system as everyone else. We're going to have this back end system to make sure that there is this, um, you're going to use the same system for sign up, but the payment process is the only differentiation between your two systems. And what this does is maximize dignity. And so during a CSA market, when you're charging a card or something to that effect, it's always best to maximize the dignity of the person. If you are, um, I'll give you an example. If you're, if you're, you have people showing up to the CSA stand to pick up their CSA and one person is pulled aside to process their EBT, that becomes an othering experience because not, I'm not, and I'm not saying people are going to look at that person and be like, oh, they're using a snap card. There's going to be questions that come up. Someone's going to be like, oh, do I have any charge left? Do I need to make a payment and start asking questions about themselves, which then puts you in a position to explain why you might be charging someone at the CSA pickup. And so in maximizing dignity, you want to be thinking about where is your terminal? Maybe you have your terminal offsite and you walk with your you walk with this person to a different site that is a specific charging site, or you you carry their CSA to their car to help them to charge them at their car. And it's not something that's in the public view and, and it's a separate process to maximize the dignity of the person and not um, have other people raise questions about that, why their process might be different than another person's. Um, be flexible in the sign up process. Something that we do at Frontline is we develop a really personal relationship with a lot of our uh, SNAP CSA members. We develop deposits. We have a contract that they sign that basically says, here's like, you're signing up for this. Let's make it very clear to you about what you're signing up for. Here's how we're going to process your EBT card and kind of lays out the whole process for them. So it's really clear. They understand how much they're going to be charged every week. And that really minimizes the, the issues of, you know, there's a limited snap amount someone gets every month. And so they can help budget what they get on their card and what they know they're going to, their card's going to get charged at your CSA stand. Um, that contract is really helpful because it also states like, oh, what you're doing as a farm and, and what can be done if like you'll, you'll develop processes within that contract about what can be done if uh, someone's card uh, runs out of money. Will you be asking them to pay on a credit card? Will you be giving them a half share? Will they double up on the next week. Like what are the options for them if a card doesn't get charged through? And that goes into the contract and makes them feel very confident being like, I know exactly how my budget or my spending will work over these 16 or 18 weeks that your CSA is. Um, as Fatima also mentioned, your first year will be small. This is gonna be like, no matter what, no matter what you do, you're only going to have uh, less than a handful of SNAP folks your first year. It's just, it's hard to get out there. It's hard for people to find you. Folks might be not be thinking ahead for the summer necessarily, but it will grow. And it's a market that will, like, we only had maybe three or five people the first couple of years. We're up to 10 to 12 SNAP customers that are regular CSA clients, and it'll just keep um, increasing. So we, we are listed on Double Up Colorado as the where it's at um, food bucks. And that has both market stands and CSA shares on the map. And people, when they go and Google CSA Snap Denver, that's one of the first things that pops up. So I would highly recommend using um, the Double Up map as a place to advertise. I would also share that in my experience, food banks and food pantries are not where you should put your energy in marketing a, a SNAP CSA. A lot of those folks are in a different situation and that's not the total population of who has SNAP. Just because they have SNAP doesn't mean they're showing up at a food pantry. It's a supplemental nutrition program and so it supplements their spending at a store. And so I would advise while food banks and food pantries are wonderful to partner with, with donations and even sales of your produce, partnering with them to do outreach with SNAP CSA um, is probably your, your efforts are gonna be better in other marketing efforts. 
that makes sense. I'm gonna pass it back to Fatima for a little bit about the, some updates about the Colorado Farmers Directory. Sure. I'm gonna to touch on this question, Casey, please help me out and Sarah. Um, so the question from Katya is about if, you know, um, a weekly CSA pickup and wants to pay for this week and next week at the same time, is that eligible because it's within 14 days or does that next week's order count as credit? I think in my mind, I would almost reverse it because certainly like my understanding is you can't give someone credit for the future but perhaps you want to think about it in reverse, if that makes sense. Go ahead, Casey. So uh, credit is basically saying that like you put money down, you have credit to spend, and that's what you want to avoid with SNAP. And so if you, if basically, no, it's the opposite. I'm saying it backwards. Think of it as a bar tab, right? You, you had a bunch of drinks, you left the bar, you didn't pay. That's credit. That's not what you do with the SNAP CSA. You want to be able to pay for every single thing that you're getting. If it's on SNAP, you're going to pay with, with the SNAP before you're like handed the produce. So within that system, I would say that's not credit. Um, what would you charge we, them for the last week, Casey? You would not be able to charge days. them for the previous okay. week. So what's important is, um, and of course, Lonnie or Sarah, correct me if I'm, I'm overstepping or misstating here. I would say you could charge them for the following week, or you can use what, uh, what not Karan, Lonnie was saying about um, how you can use the double up to to match the payment for the following week. That would probably be a good way to do it as well. But if you're running up at the end of the month and they're trying to use the, the funding on their card before it gets spent out, as long as they receive it within 14 days, my understanding is that that is the, the right way to do it. That is my understanding as well. It's just that the payment can't be accepted no more than 14 days. So if you're within that 14 day time frame, I think you would meet that criteria there. Awesome. Okay, so not what I said, what they said. And Katya, what else do you want to ask? Please, it's a little tricky there. With the double up piece, I'm thinking of a specific customer. She wants to pay once a month for some reason, um, even though she's there every week. And so could I, yeah, this is, I could charge her for like two weeks. And if she didn't pay the previous two weeks, could I then use that double up to pay for those? Like that seems a little sticky because you're not yeah. getting the afterwards. <laughs> yeah, so, so I've been told that you should not do it that way. That you should only do one week and then let them receive it the next week. Gotcha. I, I will say that we've had people um, who are super eager and understand how CSAs work and say, I have the money now. I would really like to pay now. I understand that you need to buy seeds and I want to give you my SNAP money. And it's just, it's really heartwarming and heartbreaking to be able to be like, well, this is the system we have to abide by right now. And, and the honesty goes a long way with those folks who are using um, SNAP. Same way with the, um, the contracts we do. I find a lot of people appreciate the diligence um, that you would approach it with more than saying, no, I can't accommodate something. Yeah. Katia, does your farm, does your um, farm have um, double up? Yep. Um, so, yeah, I'm also oh. wondering about how we might be able to, like, how would we be able to load over $20 a day if it's a CSA situation? Because I'm not sure um, my last day there is actually tomorrow. Um, so oh. I'm not sure if my coworkers are aware that the CSA thing is an option, um, especially okay. for like, those yeah, those customers um, that want, do want to pay in advance if, if they wanted to pay. Yeah, I, I had 
a lady pay $30 on her snap card yesterday, but then it was like, oh, you only got 20 double up. So it doesn't actually cover the whole thing. Um, oh, for CSA. Oh yeah, yeah. Have them reach out to me. Because okay, cool. another thing that I was just thinking of is for everybody, if you have um, a customer that, if you have somebody who really needs to, to pay at the beginning of the month, what you could do is you can charge them. You, y'all would have to talk to me so that I can give you paper vouchers. I don't know if you want to get into that, but I could give you yeah, paper. We, do. we have the paper vouchers. Okay. So if I gave you, so you could, you could do the match with paper vouchers and okay. that that's, that could be your workaround. So they could exactly. pay for their two weeks and then you, you use the paper vouchers to, to match and then they can use their paper vouchers up until December of 2023. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. No, it's good timing. <laughs> I think what's amazing about this conversation and us all coming together is that um, particularly for our communities, and I know for us at Frontline, as well as a BIPOC-led organization that we're on our stuff too. And at the end of the day is that where it's confusing, we can all help each other. And what I like hearing here is that we got partners like Lonnie and Sarah, um, where there is some sort of snag, like, you know, we have the tendency or myself to be like, oh, I'm gonna figure this out somehow. But what I heard here today was like, don't worry, we've thought about this too. And other people have brought this problem, here are solutions. And so it makes us not feel so scared and um, like we're doing things wrong. And there are these gray zones that everyone's saying officially, and I'm not sure exactly. And so I think we're all here in the service of meeting those goals. And I really appreciate how everyone's plugging that information and that everyone's plugged in with each other. And what I've heard is just solutions. Like you don't need to be scared. The goal makes sense and let's figure it out together. So I've heard things that I had fear around that answered some questions and I didn't know that there were certain things we could just do. Um, so thank you all. I'll transition us and I just wanna say, you know, as farmers, one of the big things about CSAs is also that you get your money up front. If you're not a nonprofit and you're for a for-profit, it really matters um, because that's what bankrolls you in the season when you have no money. And so, there is no way around that. It's also like with CSA clients, it's really nice because they sign up at that time and no matter what they paid, it's like, you're gonna come or you're not gonna come. And so sometimes with SNAP clients, when it's on that weekly basis, um, we've had good, good outcomes just because it's also about building relationships and supporting people where they're at and what happens. There's a lot of things around access and, we're trying to figure out other delivery models as well. Um, but it's also something that you dedicate yourself to meeting at that point and recognizing it's the customer base. But as a CSA, it's a little bit different because people can fall off on you. So even for us, as we're setting our CSAs um, and we're trying to definitely get SNAP clients as people we wanna serve, we have to kind of balance like, it's hard when a lot of people that already have the money come and sign up so early. And how do we reserve this for the people that will need it and we get the information too. So you have to think around what your commitments are and what you can also afford in those commitments, I would say. All right, I'm gonna transition us. Um, there was a question earlier from Perdita and my dear sister and friend, Roslyn May, who um, I don't know exactly what her title is, but basically, you know, operates the Colorado Farmers Markets Association and has been really working hard on SNAP for a couple of years. And in this model, what they've done is one of the things that can exist is that SNAP can exist at a full market. So when I lived in Wisconsin, for example, um, the market I was at already had SNAP, the whole market. And so a client comes in, gets coins, and then they exchange it at a vendor. So I just wanted to highlight to you all, um, as we're at here at this point of the season, and I was so excited for this movement forward, I'll drop in a link, but there are markets themselves that fully have SNAP, 
even as you go as a vendor. And this map showcases some that have historically been there. You can go to this website. I'll drop in here for us and see the markets that have them if you wanted to sell there to SNAP clients. And then we have some big new ones like the Pearl Street Market here in Denver, um, just got SNAP as a whole market and then the Stanley Place Marketplace as well. Um, and so that's exciting. There's movement on larger levels, which also makes people comfortable to come and know that their form of payment will be accepted as well. So I think for people as we're at this time of the season and as we're navigating this, um, it's also good to know that there are these marketplaces that you might want to think about entering. And in all of these questions we've had today for us at Frontline Farming as your farmer and BIPOC community here, we also want to offer you technical assistance. So any follow-up questions you have, um, we'll drop in our information at the end and we really want to build and help people um, as they help us with the knowledge that we have in navigating us, this. So have no fear about reaching out to us and we'll connect you to other partners as well. And you can do it. It's, it's a couple hour application. I was like, oh my God, they're asking me for all this information, um, but that's because you're taking people's financial information, but it doesn't require a monetary investment. So I mostly want to encourage everyone to do it. it harms you not, it gives you more marketing opportunities. And with that, um, I'll pass it back to Casey. I think we're going to go to Franklin, right? Yep. So, um, hey everyone again, Franklin. I'm the food access manager for Frontline Farming, which means that I lead our um, SNAP outreach team. And so for us, we recognize that Colorado has one of the lowest SNAP enrollments. And in our practice, we uh, really collaborate with a lot of partners. And so in our outreach, the way that we go out is we go out into different communities. Right now we're with Comun, Kaizen, Bienvenidos, and We Don't Waste. Um, and most of the time it is face-to-face uh, -face interactions, um, usually in car lines, um, and then sometimes uh, with people face-to-face -face as they're standing in lines. Um, as you can see, this is one of our SNAP outreach coordinators, Naomi, and on there you could see this little graphic. Um, so this is part of our strategy to help inform folks and start educating them around the SNAP program. Um, this is a quick eligibility uh, chart that just shows you based on how many people live in your household, um, how much you would have to make maximum in order to qualify. And so from there, once we determine eligibility, um, we can then do what's a pre-application. And most of that application um, is just general information around name, address, birth date, household, uh, or number of people in the household um, and their contact information. Um, I know for frontline farming, we also want to know um, how many folks over the age of 50 and how many folks under the age of 18 um, and some barriers that they may be facing um, in order to get uh, or when they're trying to enroll for SNAP. And that's just for our own internal um, uh, like operations as well. Um, and then from there, as someone who is uh, coordinating, it is our responsibility to put those in, um, applications in online and then select the contact preferences, which I think is a really important spot, um, because especially in our practice of language justice, we want to make sure that folks are being heard in the language of their hearts. So that is one of the things that we try to focus on as well as making sure that folks are being communicated and contacted um, in their language. And then uh, outside of that, once the application is online with PEAK, um, we're mainly a follow-up to make sure that their applications are completed. And if any required documents are kind of on the hold, um, following up with the people to make sure that they get that information and that their application is completed. Um, and yeah, I think outside of that, that's how then folks can start um, connecting with us and getting our CSAs or any other products that we provide. Thanks, Franklin. I, I, the only thing I would add to that is that um, while we all are advocates in our own way, we also understand that the food system as a whole has a lot of underpaid workers. And so Frontline is not only one of the, probably one of the only farms in the state that is um, a SNAP peas, a hunger-free SNAP partners engaging in application services. AKA SNAP Peas, we're one of the only partners in those areas. And um, if you feel that you or any of the staff that you employ would benefit from SNAP, 
um, please do reach out to myself or Franklin and we would love to make sure everyone in your community has access to food. So with, I'm gonna move us to the question slide. I apologize. I think, um, and then I will drop in the link one more time in case anyone has additional questions. Perfect. I can read out these questions too while Casey does that. Um, so this is the question portion, um, if y'all have any lingering things. Um, and then to our speakers, I guess, wh whichever question you feel applies to you, jump in and just help answer that. So this question, I may have missed it. How much do the wireless devices cost? If we were interested in purchasing one, is that even possible? I'll start out and then um, Casey, I think you had like lived experience that you could also um, answer for. So with the wireless devices, there's a vast majority of third party processors that you could purchase a device for. So. FIS is one of the third party processors. Um, they happen to also be the Colorado EBT vendor. So um, they process all of our EBT transactions for us. And so if Colorado is supporting you, our services are through FIS. But there are a wide variety of other third party processors. One of the handouts that I do have that will be made available um, is a handout through FNS that just talks a little bit more about third party processors, um, has some that are available out there. It's not an all inclusive list, um, but you would want to contact each one to find out what their terms are um, and what those costs are. One important question that you'll want to make sure is, um, especially being a farmer or a market um, and you would just want to make sure that you're not getting charged in a month you're not running like any transaction so some processors may charge you month like every month just to have it as like a straight lease um even if your markets or your farm is not up and running so i that i think that would be one important thing if you're looking to purchase is just making sure you understand what those terms are and what your fees are going to be. Um, and I know that there are some out there that won't charge you in a month that a transaction is not ran. Uh, yes, yeah, Sarah, I would add, um, so when we lo lost the funding from the state, we did enter a contract with FIS uh, through the Verifone wireless. I will say that the device itself worked really well. The wireless device they gave us was really good. It was a monthly fee of um, $45 that would hit any time you ran a snap, um, like a purchase, a snap purchase through the device. And then there was an additional 11 cent fee per transaction. So that that's kind of what I think is mostly market price at this point. There are some that are a little lower. I think total pay is a little lower. And then something else you'd want to consider like these wireless devices, there's some that are like EBT only that only accepts the EBT card and snap purchases and others that will accept, you know, EBT debit and credit. So you'll just want to take into consideration, are you wanting this wireless device to also process debit and credit? You know, what are those charges for debit and credit? Do they also, you know, add EBT? What are those costs? So that would be something else you would just want to consider as you're, you know, reaching out and researching to see what best meets your needs. Great, thank you for that one. Next question, um, how do we apply to take double up food bucks? Oh, okay, sorry, hey y'all. Okay, so um, typically the um, application goes out in um, January um, of every year. And then um, we um, start accepting people in February. Um, the requirements are that you, um, of course, are already accepting SNAP and um, hopefully have been accepting SNAP for a year. Um, there is a caveat to that. If you are in a community that really needs um, double up food bucks um, and there are no other double up food bucks partners around, 
um, then you and I can have a conversation to see what we can do. Um, if you're already wanting to, if you are thinking about doing Double Up Food Bucks for this um, season, um, just contact me. I'm going to put my, um, I'm going to put the email address where you can email me into the chat right now and just uh, send me an email and we'll see what we can do um, about this year. Um, if not, definitely next year. I think that's such a good question because it's like, if you have SNAP, you want to be in it. And thanks for offering that, Lonnie. And I think that um, for our farmers, they're so busy at these times and all the time, really. We think the winters yeah. are downtime. And so my ask would be that we can share this information in advance. I know why I was able to get on it on the early side, even as we got SNAP. So I think one of our works for Mile High Farmers will be to ensure that our farmers get that information really in November so they can gear up to apply and know these opportunities that are available. So we'll ask for that guidance and help in connecting in that and getting the information out. It's really about access to information. Yeah, absolutely. So this year, you know, this is my first year. So next year I have a whole different way. I'm going to start much earlier so that we can get as much as we can done before, um, you know, for your, before your season starts. So. And welcome. We're glad to have you. And Lonnie's also offered her email and is a human that's here. Institutions and systems are made of humans. And so reach out to her and I'm sure she'll help you navigate this, if not this season, but for the next and get on it. If you have SNAP, why don't you have um, double up dollars? And I'm pretty certain that all of the double up dollars that are generally allotted don't get used. That is correct. So that's why I'm, I'm, if, I'm encouraging you, if you are in a, a space, if you're somewhere where there's a lot of double up partners, it's gonna be a little harder for me to push your case. But if you are somewhere that there are not a lot of double up uh, partners around or in an underserved community, even if there are double up partners around, but you're in an underserved community, please reach out to me and we'll, we'll see what we can do. Even if you are new to SNAP, just, just hit me up. Thanks, Lonnie. Appreciate it. Um, so yeah, if there are any questions that are lingering, um, you know, definitely type them into the chat real quick. If not, feel free to email someone um, on the presentation team, myself, Casey, Sarah, Lani, or Fatima, and we can make sure to try to get the information you're looking for. Um, just for a quick housekeeping recap, um, we are going to send out the slide that Sarah uh, was sharing, as well as some other FNS materials that she was sharing as well. Um, Lani, I already know, provided her email for contact, so please hit her up if that is something that you need to explore. Um, Frontline Farming is always here with um, any kind of information, and Willow will be sending out some files through Mile High Farming, so just keep an eye out for that. Um, with that being said, I'm just going to close this out with a little blessing and then y'all get to have a little bit more of your night back. So again, wherever you're at, take a second to release whatever tension we were holding because we were sitting for a minute. Shoulders away from the ears, hips right, flat and centered, shoulders above your hips. If you're standing, feet under your hips. Taking a couple of deep breaths. Really releasing any tension on the exhale. Pulling in some grace, gratitude. Catch your last breath. I wanna thank our bodies for sitting here, being patient with us. I wanna thank our minds for receiving information in these later hours of the day after a whole day of work. I wanna appreciate your hearts for doing this work and being in these spaces, being who you are and providing for your community. Thank you for the visionaries who saw this as a need of the community and provided the actions to make it happen. Thank you to everyone who has accumulated the information tonight and for sharing that with people who are so willing to learn. Thank you everyone for this opportunity for coming together as Denver food people and Colorado food people. With that, please be blessed tonight. Take care and see y'all next time. Amen. Thanks for coming.